Welcome to Washington, D.C. It's such a pleasure to be here. Let's see how I'm going to do this. Okay, great. Um, I'm actually going to dispel some myths <laughs> because uh, uh, everyone, it's on everyone's, oh, D.C. is like Africa, don't you know? And you know, I've been, I worked in Pepfar extensively. I was on the African continent 30 times. And I learned a tremendous amount. Uh, and uh, DC has a very different epidemic and very different response. Um, I think the interesting story might be uh, the lessons we've learned globally. And uh, uh, many of the things I learned in Africa, I'm applying here in the United States. I mean, that, that, that's, a, that's a more interesting story to me. But the nature of the epidemic, I think, the comparison of, of DC and Africa is um, really clouds the issue, doesn't really uh, lead us to any good conclusion, but let me tell you why. So let's set the first slide first. Oh, I can use the slide? Okay, great. So here's a, just a little overview of, of uh, the District of Columbia. Let me say a little bit about our, our jurisdiction. Uh, we are divided into four eights. We have about uh, 600,000 people, just over half a million people in the District of Columbia. About half of us are African-American, followed by whites, and then Hispanics. We've got a large number of African immigrants and uh, Asian immigrants, too. It's a very multicultural, multi-ethnic city. Um, the neighborhoods, however, cluster by race. So you see that the, the neighborhoods on the eastern side of the city are more black than, the, than on the western part of the city. With that said, DC is not a city. It's not a state. It's not a country. It's a little tiny piece of a big metropolitan area. So if you look on the, if this, is this a pointer? Okay, there. So if you, there's metropolitan Washington. Part of it's in Virginia, part of it's in Maryland. It's about five cities, it's about 18 different counties. It's a big metropolitan area. This is when we talk about Metro DC. And this little part here is that cutout, that, that, that jurisdiction that I live in, that I'm responsible for people who are HIV positive. And uh, if you look at the metropolitan area, the rate's about 0.6. Now, if you look at other American cities, you see an interesting picture. So let's put it into, into context. An important study at the CDC tells us that half of people who are HIV positive in the United States live in 12 cities. And the real picture here is DC is one of the 12 cities. We're not the worst, we're not the best. Actually, Miami, oops. Button. Miami, Baltimore, just an hour south of here in New York, have worse rates of infection than DC. For me, it's less important to focus which is worse. You know, it's urban America has a serious epidemic. Black America has a, a, a serious epidemic, and gay America has a, a, a serious epidemic. I'm a I'm a gay man, and this has been affecting my community for decades now. Uh, and of course, in DC as I'm going to tell you, uh, we have a lot of gay people, a lot of poor black people, and a lot of HIV. So that's the, that's the story that I'd like to, to say about DC in, in context. You know, if you, if you picked out uh, an inner city in an African, you know, say go to Nairobi or go to Lagos and, and look at a particular small seg segment of town where a lot of poor people are, you might find 50, 50 or 60 percent HIV positive in those places. So the comparisons are not really appropriate. We're not, again, because we're not even a city, we're a cutout. Okay, but let's look at that cutout now, because this is the, this is the 63 uh, square miles of, uh, of this continent that I'm responsible for in HIV. These are the, the 1,400 HIV positive people that I have to take care of. So DC has about 14,000 HIV positive people. We have about a 2.7% rate in the population of that 600,000, 2.7% are positive. And you see that the rates, oops, the rates track the sociodemographics. This is where black people live. Poor black people tend to live in this part. This is where gay people live in this part of town. So you see that the, popu that the infection rates, the levels of infection track the, where the populations are. This is a um, very interesting <coughs> Uh, slide that puts things into a, another context. So the World Health Organization defines an epidemic 
as a condition that's prevalent in a population at least of 1% or greater. So for most groups in DC, we have an epidemic for overall, obviously, 2.3. This is the, this is the uh, DC rate, and that's the 1% rate. So overall, we have a, a, an epidemic. Black men are almost 7%. Hispanic men are 3%. Black females, 2.6%. White males, 2.4%. So we see all, all these major groups have epidemic rates of HIV in the District of Columbia. So um, here we are looking at it by race, and we see that blacks are disproportionately infected. Oops, here we go. So 50% of the population is black in DC, but 75% of the cases in the District of Columbia of HIV are people who are are uh, African American or di diaspora um, black. For women, it's even starker. 91% of women who are positive are black. Now this is because we're, we are a black city. We're a majority black city for centuries, actually, for not centuries, for, for decades and decades. We have black leadership. I'm, as a gay man, I'm very proud to be part of a black city because there's a, um, uh, it's a very progressive place. We have, we have gay marriage here in D.C. and It's always a joke to me. I, people say, oh, black people are so conservative. And I say, ah, I don't know any conservative black people. They're all really progressive. We have, you know, we have needle exchange here. We have treatment on demand. It's an incredibly progressive city. And as I say, we have, we have gay marriage. It was passed by a majority black le a legislature. So here is the disease. These are people living with HIV by mode of transmission, so how they got it. So the 40%, the biggest mode of transmission is still MSM, men who have sex with men. Second is heterosexuality, 28%, making it very different from Africa. And then 15% here is intermediate drug users. So we have a, a mixed epidemic. We have a modern, what we call a modern epidemic. It's a very complex epidemic. And it's much like this in places like Baltimore, Philadelphia, Atlanta, New York, Chicago. This is, this is a pretty typical picture, although this is a, the specific uh, take on it. Historically, um, uh, uh, gay men and lesbians moved to the centers of the city to establish communities. And DC is one of those very historic uh, uh, gay, uh, gay communities. So this is the, um, the picture over time. And this is a little bit of a good news. The theme of this conference is turning the tide. In DC, we're beginning to see a turning of the tide. I don't want to be too enthusiastic. We've got a lot of work to do. But we're beginning to see important um, improvements. First of all, death rates. We've been having death rates decline. We've had, over the last five years, a 50% decline in death rate. We're down to about 200, but even that is less because half of those, those are all people who are HIV uh, positive. So we had 200 people who are HIV positive die in 2010. But not everybody dies of AIDS. Some people die in automobile accidents and heart attacks, other things. So it's actually only half of those are dying from a preventable disease. So that rate is very important. We're seeing a declining deaths. We're also seeing a decline in new diagnoses, gradual decline in new diagnoses. Again, we're somewhat tentative about it. It's, it's real in the numbers. It's been sustained for a number of years. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about why I think this, is, this really is true. Uh, and of course, then, the top number is the prevalence estimate, the number of people living with the disease. So if more people are getting infected, or even if the same number of people are getting infected, and less people are dying, then you have more people who are HIV positive. So the prevalence is going to, for a while, is going to keep going up and up and up. And in some ways, that's a good thing, because people are living. Probably the main reason why we're, why we're seeing decreased numbers of new infections in the District of Columbia is our very successful needle exchange program. As you saw in the earlier slide, needle uh, use is an important vector. It's an important mode of transmission in the district. And in 2007, 
we started doing needle exchange using government <coughs> programs. Earlier to that, there were underground, actually illegal programs put on by NGOs and at their peril, although saving lives. Um, but in 2007, the city legalized it and started funding it, and you see a very rapid increase in needles exchange. We set a new record last year, and I hope that we're set a new set a new record this year. And as a consequence of that, infections drop dramatically. So I think that's one of our success stories. That's one of the ways that the District of Columbia is turning the tide and uh, why we're seeing a beginning to see less new cases. Uh, this is another good, good news slide. So as the previous speaker said, once you've been diagnosed, you need to get into treatment. And DC is an incredible city. We have treatment on, on demand. The mayor has made that a policy. Everybody in the District of Columbia who has HIV can get medications, full stop. But having the diagnose, just having access, formal access, is not enough. You gotta get to the doctor. And even in, this, in a city with as much education and communication and support, a lot of people have problems getting there. There's stigma, there's discrimination, there's, fe there's fear, there's fear. People don't want to go because they say, oh, then, you know, I'll, I'll be on medications, my, fa my family will know, they'll see me taking the medications. So there's a lot of issues that people have to go through. We've been able to overcome that through a very, a very concerted effort, a connecting pro program, connecting people to care. And over time, this blue bar at the bottom is the percentage of people HIV positive who've been connected to care within three months. And that number's gone up and up and up. We've been doing, we're now over seven, what is 76% of people who are diagnosed are in care. That is, they see a doctor, they get, they get a CD4 count, they get a viral load. That's actually how we monitor it uh, within, within three months. Uh, actually, many of those are in, in, we have this program where we try to get people within 72 hours. That's kind of the standard. We try to get the, get the people really connected really fast. 90% of people see a doctor within a year. This is another piece of good news and another way we see that in DC we're beginning to turn the tide. CD4 count at the time of diagnosis is, inc is increasing. So the CD4 count is a measure, a rough measure of the health of your immune system. If your CD4 count's low, it means you've got bad disease. If it's high, you're healthy. When you find people earlier in the disease, that means they're still healthy, which is good. And we've been finding people, these are year after year, from 2006 to 2010, the median CD4 count at the time of diagnosis. And that's been going up. So that means we're finding people earlier. Our testing is not just waiting for people to get sick and come in. We, are, we have a very aggressive testing program. We have do testing in most, in most emergency rooms, kind of as a routine, most of our big clinics. We have testing in our uh, Department of Motor Vehicles. When you go and get your li driver's license, you can get your a free HIV test there. Um, there's an, um, a welfare office or program, a place where you go and you get your food stamps or Medicaid or whatever social services you need. And we give HIV testing there, test, HIV testing in pharmacies, HIV testing in, in um, um, libraries. There's lots of 20, 22 places all across the city for, that, that have free testing sites. Uh, DC also has 93% of people who have health insurance. Almost everybody in the District, district of Columbia has health insurance. We're number two in the nation. Uh, so people should be getting it at their doctor's office as a routine. Uh, this is the final data slide. I'm going to spend a little time uh, on this because this is the real challenge. This is where we're at right now with treatment. We've got to do a lot more with uh, testing. We have maybe five, 6,000 people walking around the streets of D.C. who are HIV positive and don't know it. So that's a problem. Despite all the testing, but despite the extensive amount of money we spend, there are a lot of people uh, who, are, who are HIV positive don't know it. And actually those people, we believe from studies, are projecting 50% of the new infections. So that's the group we really want to get after. But we want to keep people alive and healthy. And this is called the Gardner Cascade or the care continuum. And let me go through this. And as I say, this is the real challenge for uh, the future. 
Uh, DC has a very advanced data system. We're one of two cities in all of the United States that has this kind of data now. And we reported this first in our rep in our annual report that came out last, last month. So we're very excited about this, the first, first time to be presenting this in public, this, uh, this meeting. So this is a study of the last five years. And over five years, because that's the way the data is most accurate, we found about 4,878 people HIV positive. Of those, 4,347 were connected to care. So again, we're doing pretty good. You've seen that before in that last slide. Little drop off here, but pretty good. The next drop off is staying in care. The light blue bar is continuous care, which is what you want. And here's sporadic care. So we get people tested, we get them into care, and then they don't go to the doctor. The next two bars are virally suppressed. This is ever achieving viral suppression and continuously achieving viral suppression. The whole purpose of this antiretroviral business is to suppress the virus. The virus gets kind of locked in the cell by the uh, medication, so it doesn't go around destroying your immune system, and then also doesn't spread to other people, so that's the good thing. If you're not on the medication, none of that's happening. If you're not suppressed, we're not, we're not seeing the benefits either for the individual body or for the public. And you see here that only a quarter of people who should be suppressed, who know they're positive, in a city where everyone has access. There's no financial barriers. It's a small city. It's not like you have to drive 100 miles to go to a doctor. It's not like we don't have enough doctors. We, you know, we've got a very strong medical system, but people still don't stand medication for many, many complicated reasons. We're doing a session on this uh, in the Global Village. You might look in the program. My name's on that program, and you'll hear more about what that problem's about and how we're going to try to address it. But that's the, that's the big challenge for us. Uh, looking up, just end, actually I'll leave that, by re just reviewing the uh, programs here in the Dist District of Columbia. Uh, our rapid uh, routine testing I told you about, we've tripled uh, test, uh, test kits available uh, from 2007. Uh, we're doing a very exciting, for IS, if you want to do a story about a, something that's going on right now, the, the signature, signature piece for the Department of Health, District of Columbia around testing is going on during IS. Uh, IS. We're doing a testing program for government employees. And the mayor has given two hours to each government employee, one to get some training, and one to actually go and get the test. And we're doing that, um, I believe my, uh, our uh, media person, Mr. Carfin's here, and we can tell, or maybe it's probably in the media room, but there's gonna be tours of those, of those, of those uh, lectures. You can see how DC's government is engaging with our, our unions, with our workers, and, and promoting them to ask for the test. I mentioned uh, that we do um, testing in non-traditional places, Department of Motor Vehicles, public benefit offices. Uh, I mentioned our uh, linkage to care, treatment on de demand. I'm also very, I kind of left this for last, uh, very proud of a long-standing, very strong media campaign to educate people. People need to know about HIV, they need to continuously be uh, uh, encouraged to use condoms. We have award-winning uh, programs for um, our social marketing. Uh, we gave out five million condoms. DC is a national leader in the female condom. Um, so with that, I think I'll stop. And um, any questions, I'll be happy to answer. OK, if you want to go to the uh, mic. In the meantime, while she gets to the microphone, I want to ask you a question, Dr. Pappas, and is how um, how did this trick came up out with the uh, needle exchange program? What was the process? Was it difficult? Yeah, it and was difficult, what yeah. type of oppositions were you well, facing? Yeah, uh, it was difficult. Um, even in a very progressive city, it was very difficult. It's doubly difficult because uh, DC is not a state. We're, a, we're kind of a department of the federal government. And even though we collect our own local tax dollars, they have to go through Congress and the Republican Congress <coughs> put a national ban on needle, needle exchange. It won't allow us to use federal dollars. We get money from our local tax dollars and also from the federal government. The federal government will not let us use those dollars for needle exchange. We have to use our local DC dollars. But you know what? In a city that's got a high rate of HIV, our leadership understands our people, and they know that needle exchange is there, it, needles are there, 
And we, you know, we, we want to stop the spread of this disease. The other important point is that needle exchange is not just given needles. We go in there and we go into their houses. I've been out with these folks. We, you know, we do wound, wound healing. And we also encourage them to come to treatment. A thousand people have come off the streets and into treatment for substance abuse out of this program. So it's not just needle exchange. It's trying to address the problems of these, uh, the, of these, these people who have very serious problems. And um, we're very proud of that aspect of it. DC also has treatment on demand for substance abuse. Many cities, most cities, have waiting, waiting lists for substance abuse, maybe six months. DC has no, no waiting list. You can be put into, into a treatment program uh, immediately that day if you come forward for substance abuse. Uh, Dr. Pappas, um, Antoine Craigwell, um, for a number of different publications. One of the things I heard in your presentation, or I didn't hear in your presentation, is that there are a number of reports or have been reports that DC is, uh, as a city, is financially compromised, which means they don't have funding. So how is DC able to pay for all these programs for HIV? Actually, DC is financially very fit right now. Uh, the last mayor uh, kind of put us in a bit of a deficit or spent down some reserves, but um, this mayor uh, was very strict about balancing the budget, cutting some programs, raising taxes a little bit, and actually we have triple, AAA bond rating right now. Uh, it's a tough economic time all through the United States, uh, but DC, uh, compared to many cities, is financially much better. Uh, we get a lot of money from the federal government, too. I mean, they're our major employer. We, don't, we can't tax the federal government, but they give us a payment. Um, yeah, Please. hi, Dr. Pappas. Uh, Victoria Kupchinatsky, Russian Service Voice of America. Um, I, uh, I report for the area for Russia um, where harm reduction programs are banned. They are completely and totally illegal. And methadone. And methadone. Uh, so problem. if we I could, methadone in DC. if I could ask you to, I know you talked twice already about the harm reduction and needle exchange. If you could elaborate a little yeah, bit, and how did you guys actually manage to? break the tide in 2007. Before that, uh, there were underground groups for needle yeah. exchange. And then uh, now it's, it, to me, it's amazing that it's being funded by, by yeah, from yeah. the it's, city. It's funds. fabulous. It's fabulous. Mm -hmm. we, have some, <laughs> we have some outstanding political leaders in the city. That the chairman of our health committee, David Catania, is a, a, a very noble and very uh, strong man. Our mayor is, is incredible on HIV. Uh, and um, it was it was leadership. They worked. You know, uh, we have we have a lot of um, you know, DC is like every place else in America in the sense we've got a lot of religious people, a lot of churches, tons of churches, black churches, white churches, and you know, uh, the, the the political leadership and the public health leadership. My boss, Muhammad Akhtar, went to the leadership of the churches and said, "Listen, you know, our children are dying. You know, we don't like this either. <laughs> we don't like the fact that we have drug addiction in this in this in this city." But you know, people are dying. We have to respond to this and help people. And that sort of human dialogue ultimately, ultimately and the other piece is this treatment piece. I'm very, I mean, President Bush made a point, made a statement about, well, if it was white people, right, white kids w w that we had, had um, uh, IV drug problems, we would be just throwing them needles. We'd, been, you know, we'd be, have this you know, massive program to help them uh, with their addiction program problem. But in DC we do. We have treatment on demand for, for addiction. So it's an important thing. Those two, I think, balance the... Uh, the, issue, um, the issue is police have their own power. <laughs> so it's working with the police too. So working with the community but working with the police and getting them to agree. So we, we have a program. You know, drugs are illegal in DC. But Needles and needles are illegal in DC unless you're registered with a program. So you get registered with a program, they give you a little credit card, and if the police stop you and got needles, you show them your credit card and they, they, they leave you alone. So it's, it's, a, it's a very thoughtful pro, pro, uh, um, project. Uh, you can't just throw things at people. You've got, you got to respect the society, you've got to respect the institutions and do it in a way that, that works. And what is the situation with methadone? Me we have free methadone too. Uh, to treat, uh, buprenorphine and methadone are replacement therapy for heroin. And uh, there are clinics where people come in, they want to get off of, stop using needles, they want to get off of drugs, and we give them this, uh, this replacement therapy. I have, I have one more slide. I'm going to take, I want to, 
Can I can I do one more slide? Okay, yeah. fine. And then and then ask the questions. <laughs> I, you know, so it's IES. So everyone wants to know bold new steps. And guys, I got one for two for you. I, I I'm very proud of this. My, my our leadership at our department. On that treatment cascade, the fact that people don't stay in medicine, on their medicines, we're moving towards the HIV patient-centered medical home. This is towards comprehensive care, a wellness journey, and treatment support. One, a, a different from Europe, the United States has had, not had a long, a long history of well-coordinated, well-developed medical system. We have private sector and public sector, and it's kind of fragmented. We spend. 25% more than European country, com, countries on our health care, and we have poor outcomes. The, the patient centered medical home, the well coordinated care, is what Europe has done for years, and we're moving towards that model in the care delivery. The other major, I think, bold new idea is what we're calling domestic PEPFAR. For, this is important for this urban epidemic. So, DC is this tiny little piece that has a lot of HIV, and we've got Maryland and Virginia and all these cities and states. We need to work together. It's one social, economic, and epidemiological unit. The diseases know no, no, no borders. So as jurisdictions, we've got to work together. We need, need the federal government to do, uh, do their job to help us work together. The three things I learned in PEPFAR were, first of all, enhanced funding, enhanced coordination. In African clinics, you know, getting money from here and money from there and money from all the, you know, it makes it difficult. I have 15 different federal grants that have 15 different uh, calendars that I have to report on a 15 different set of, 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 of indicators. There needs to be one. And federal government, and this is all federal government, but coming from different agencies. And the same thing's true, but the same problem of coordination is Maryland, Virginia, and the, the, in the, across the areas. We don't have a data system together. I showed you DC. I wish I had metropolitan DC. I don't have it. We have people who live right across the street in another state and they can't use their, their, their Medicaid card for a clinic acro literally across the street. So we need better coordination. So that's what we're calling. We, uh, the, our mayor and the governor of Maryland wrote a letter to the president of the United States asking for domestic pet farm. Ma'am? OK. Uh, as you mentioned, that a lot of tourists we uh, find uh, everywhere in Washington and USA. So there should be some uh, rule uh, to before getting uh, issuance of any visa for any immigrants or visitor. So it would be helpful to uh, restrict it to the spread of this disease. Well, actually... Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and in addition of one thing is very important that maybe, might be, uh, tourism will affect a lot if we will go to... Well, actually, the United States moving in just the opposite direction. The whole reason the United States that this meeting is in Washington, uh, D.C. starting tomorrow, is because the D.C., the U.S. government dropped their ban. The International Aid Society refused to come to the United States for 22 years because the, D, the, 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 uh, the United States banned people who are HIV positive from coming into the country. And uh, so IS never came. One of the things that President um, Obama did was to drop that ban. I, I'm less worried about the person who's HIV positive because, you know, they're on the medication, they're they're, uh, they're maintaining their health and they're aware of it. I'm more wor worried about the person who's not even been, been tested, and they come and go all the time. Yep. So, so there should be a certain process for uh, tasting before leaving uh, no. any visa now? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It's, it's, it, it's, a it's, a human, it's a human rights abuse. I'll talk to you. Oh, Actually, right. I've done a study. You know, you know, I was at the Aga Khan Un University in, Ka in Karachi. Yeah. I did a study on, on, uh, on this issue okay. in the Gulf. So let's have some, com some I conversation. I have a second question about sure. the monitoring. If uh, many countries are definitely getting funds for, to fight with this disease, and uh, people who are belongs to rural areas especially, they couldn't understand how to get medicines. So uh, do you think uh, a communication uh, and monitoring process should be uh, more enhanced and need to be? Yeah, uh, absolutely. African countries have done very well. Uh, they've been at it for longer than Pakistan yeah. uh, and working with rural populations. It's a different, different set of communication. It's a different, a lot of that work goes, goes on in churches and door to door, but it's very important, uh, very important activity. Because I, I met with two patients uh, who are HIV positive 
the person who was delivering the medicine, uh, they were uh, getting for a one month medication, mm. and uh, the person who uh, giving the medicine medicines, they were unable to understand how they have to get medicine twice a day and uh, in which quantity. They was unable to understand then how one can cope with this disease. Yeah, the, it's, again, a, it's a bit what, difficult. What what I learned in Africa, I mean African um, uh, experience. I, you saw them. My 25% of, of people who should be on antiretrovirals are suppressed. In Africa, people are on antiretrovirals. They get suppressed. They're very good about taking their medication. Much better than the United States. B back in the old days, there was that whole. Do you remember that? Yeah, Africans will 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 will, will joke and laugh. You remember that? Oh, we can't do uh, antiretrovirals in Africa because they don't have watches and they can't. They won't be able to take their medicine on time. You remember that? You know, it was completely wrong. I mean, Africans have been very excellent, outstanding at the highest levels of. Of, of utilization rates have been in, in, in African studies. And it's a lot of it's because of community support. Community support, church support and community support. African communities pull together and these people go around the house and hey, you know, around the neighborhood and said, hey, did you take your medication today? Let's take our medication together. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Hi, um, I have my DC resident hat on now. So um, my question is about the social media campaigns, um, because I live in DC for a long time and agree that there have been some really effective social media campaigns done. Two things, um, can you just talk briefly about how your office um, funds those campaigns? Basically, who provides the support to do them? And then also, the one thing I was really surprised about was I didn't know about library testing, DMV, all of that. So where is information available on that, those specific uh, you can, uh, the, uh, on the website, you can go in and, and find about our, there are various uh, testing settings. Um, we uh, have uh, a very creative internal staff. Uh, Mr. Carpenter, are you here? Michael Carpenter is a uh, media, me, media person extraordinaire for HIV. He's been doing it for 30 years and is an outstanding, outstanding communicator. Uh, Mr. Carpenter leads our internal effort. You can talk to him. Uh, here as part of this um, uh, venue. Uh, we also have a contract through uh, Oct Octane. Yes, it's a professional media group that um, jazzes our stuff up. They, you guys got to come and see our training in, for the government workers. They did this really cool video uh, with actors. We, you know, we did a little role playing. You know, the doctor, the patient goes into the doctor and says, you know, I need a doctor. I need an HIV test. And the doctor says, oh, why? Well, the Department of Health says, anyway, it's, it's adorable. Mike will tell you all about it. Oh, Najma's here too. Our media relations person for the Department of Health is also here, an outstanding, another outstanding resource for you. Hi, uh, my name is Marcelo Maia. I'm HIV positive, a photographer, and an activist from New York City. I am curious about what this is doing about this uh, race of infection among black and Hispanics. And black is really scary, 7% of the general population, correct? Yes. That you're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, and then 40% uh, of these infections are among men that have sex with men. And I'm considered uh, especially con uh, concerned about young uh, men of color that have sex with men, which are seeing rates of infections Naturally, rising yeah. still, while all the other ones are falling. What yeah. is this doing about that? Thank you. Yeah, well, we're working at the, the um, Everything we're talking about, we're working on it. Uh, we've got lots of special outreach to the MSM community. Um, the bad news on this, it, we've done a lot of studies on this, and uh, you know, so is a gay man, I'll tell you, tell, tell you our dirt. You know, gay men are still having too many sex partners, and they're not using condoms enough. And it's an interesting story, because one of our black uh, MSM uh, leaders came to us and said, Doc, Doc, what's going on? You know, Black guys are still getting infected more than white guys, and we're using condoms more, which is true. They've done a good job. We've got 60% condom <coughs> coverage among black MSM. It's about 50. It's still not enough. It's not enough for blacks, whites, or anybody. You know, we need to be using condom rate, condoms at a much higher rate. It needs to be about 90%. We learned that early in the epidemic in Asia, the, the experience in Thailand. They had a serious um, epidemic among sex workers, and they got their condom use up to 90%, it stopped the transmission. So while we're doing better on condom use, I mean, you know, going up from six, Mr. Carp and I had kind of a disagreement on this. And our, our work group, our MSM work group set up, set up a, 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 um, a, a target for, okay, we're gonna increase, you know, condom use from 60 to 65%. I said, guys, that's not enough. 
It's not enough. It's got to be 90%. We've got to do much more in that area. Two more questions? Is that um, Hi. Hi, Dr. Papas. I am Leo, and I'm from the Philippines, and I just came from the Youth Free Conference. And one of the topic that was um, in one of the parallel sessions was about HIV criminalization here in the United States. So my question would be, um, what is the rate of a HIV criminalization here in Washington, D.C., and how, um, how did your office or how did the city help assist these people living with HIV who were in jail for even minor offenses? Okay, so criminalization of HIV means you're in, in, in jail because you're HIV positive. Yeah. Or you get, we don't have that. It's not a problem in D.C. Now, we have a big problem of people who are HIV positive who are returning. We call, we call them returning citizens. So people who have been in jail or in prison and come, and it's a lot, you know, larger. The African American population in the United States has a large problem uh, with going in and out of prisons. It's a huge numbers. Uh, so we've got thousands of people who have been in prison who come back home, and it's difficult for them to find jobs. It's difficult to fi help them to find housing. The, what we do uh, in, our, in our department is we try to, we, you know, they come out of prison, we know they're positive, and we try to make sure that they get connected with care because at least they have doctors, at least they'll get, get, uh, get care. There's medicine for them. Last Hi, uh, my name is Tarandeep Anand. I work for the Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Center. And I would like to ask and learn from your experiences that how do you promote early HIV testing among MSM in Washington? and consistent condom use and about the strategies that you apply. Yep. Because prevalence among MSM in Thailand is like 30%. Yep. And we have come up with a new campaign and it's working very nice. So I would like to know, learn about your experiences as well. Well, I mean, we're not doing too much better. <laughs> among uh, minority MSM, one in four are HIV positive. Among whites, it's one in 10. So we have very high rates among MSM. If you're, if you're gay in America, you have a 60% chance of becoming HIV by the time you're 60. It keeps happening. It's not just a disease of young people. I mean, we've got people in their 60s, 70s getting HIV positive. I'm waiting for my first case to come out of a nursing home. Yeah, it's, it, it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. Um, so um, um, we, um, I personally think that's, that's an area where we need to do a lot more creative thinking. And I'd love you and Mr. Mr. Carfin should talk because Mr. Carfin also designs our our MSM program, because we'd love to learn about what Thailand's doing. And I, I'm aware of uh, some of the work in Thailand. Um, we've, uh, this is kind of a general statement, but let me say, make it anyway. There's so much emphasis on the treatment now. We're so excited about the medication that the old stuff has gotten a little less exciting, a little less energy. And we need to re-energize that whole activity. We can't forget, we can't throw the baby out in the, with bath water. We talk about a, a toolkit. And the whole point is, adding new tools, not throwing away the old tools when you get the, the new tools. And I'm afraid there's, that's a little bit of the problem. We're re-looking at the way we do uh, uh, education. The old style education in the United States used to, used to focus on small groups of people, and it wasn't very cost effective. And anyway, it's, it's kind of been, been discredited now. Looking at more mass media campaigns and other strategies is something that we're beginning to look at. But I think there's a big need for research in that area, and we'd love to hear about it. Thank you so much.